Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was so good. Um, applauding for on behalf of everybody who's tuned in right now. Um, let's see here. So we are now moving into the Q and A part of this webinar. We probably have more questions than we can answer, so we're capturing those and we'll be taking a look at them in the following days. Moderating the Q and A is Deb Walkenheim, the Open Notes Assistant Director of Research Dissemination. Deb, what are we seeing in the chat box? All right, there are a lot of questions. So. Um... We care for patients and families. There are often many dynamics and important information or perspectives that vary between patients and family members. I'm thinking particularly about differences between patient and family perception on situation and information preferences or different opinions. For example, the patient won't talk about end of life, family is willing. Um, do we document? What do we document? Yeah, I, I think recognizing that we're we are caring for people with different viewpoints and is does it belong in one note does it belong in different notes if there is a lot of conflict in those notes it that again that may be a place where it may be marked as unshared or sensitive but you also want to think is there a way instead of saying this is sensitive to say how i document this in reflecting different people's ideas i can summarize that without necessarily um uh undermining their approach. And I think that is where each situation is gonna present different opportunities and different challenges. Um, and that's where we as teams need to talk about this. So I think we are patient-centered enough, caregiver-centered enough, and we know enough about how we use the words that I have confidence that palliative care people can come up with creative ways that reflect the situation, respect the patient and caregivers, even with differing viewpoints, and can still actually use the note as a tool to hopefully advance and reduce the conflict and bring things closer together. Okay, um, prognostic information is in our notes, not just for the patient's benefit, it's also something important for colleagues to be aware of as they make treatment plans. If the patient declines to discuss prognosis, how do you also convey prognosis to colleagues who are the original intended recipients of the notes? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's again where the inter-team communication may need different areas to do that. So um, I have started having, like after the visit, to, to check in with the physician uh, who referred, say here's here's what we did, here's what I think the prognosis is. So I'm actually using that a little bit more in my physician physician to physician communication, and also in in many EHRs, there's areas where you can write notes to self that are not necessarily released to the patient. Um, like Epic has a sticky note or specialty comments. Um, the chances for those to be discoverable or found at some point may be there, but in the in the short term, you may be able to write notes to yourself to be able to keep track of that in a very more, more explicit um, and direct way, whereas your note might have more indirect language. Um, so I think this is an area where we, we, I think we still should document prognosis, but it should be documented with that permission of the patient, just like we wouldn't barge in and verbally communicate prognosis to them without their permission. We shouldn't communicate through writing without their permission as well. Is there guidance for discussing concerns about cognition or decision-making capacity? It can take several visits to feel certain that a person's decision-making capacity is impaired, though we might suspect it from the first visit. On the flip side, sometimes we suspect impaired capacity at the first visit, but with time it is more clear it is not an issue. Yeah, <laughs> this is a tough one. Um, and I think this is where, um, I think it's important to what your in-visit language is to start to open up these areas. And I think there's ways that we can talk about our concerns about decision-making capacity in the visit um, that don't seem scary or so off-putting to say, hey, your thinking sometimes isn't connecting well. That worries me on how we can help you best understand over the next few visits, let's let's. I'm gonna really talk and make sure I understand how your brain is working, so that we can make the best decisions together. Um, and then writing that, writing something similar in your note can highlight still to other clinicians and to your teammates and to your future self. Okay, we're still addressing decision-making capacity issues, but maybe using the language that is not so directly clinical, um, but reflects what we saw in the visit. How do you document notes for patients who do not want to know everything about their serious illness? And how do you write notes with cultural humility and competency? So the first one, if someone is a really a strong information rejector, 
Um, I, I've had a couple of patients like this, and, I, and first of all, I find that they're actually not on the EHR portal. Like they, they, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, or if they are, it's only for technical access for a caregiver or proxy. So if they really refuse it, what I tell them is I need to document that, and I know you don't want to see that. So what I would recommend is that if you don't want to see any of that information, you don't read the note. Our after visit summary will have instructions. That's going to be the thing that you want to read. But to care for you best and to work with your other physicians and team, I need to write that in there. So I basically kind of help them find out how to wear their their uh, their limited vision goggles. Um, and the second one, oh, cultural humility. That I think is um, an ongoing conversation. I think it it. It, it probably mirrors a lot of what we try to do when we're in visit or, or verbally or Zooming um, and how we try to do that. We want to reflect um, respect uh, for individuals um, as well as respect for their uh, cultural background. Um, and I, I think that's where if you don't feel like you have a good understanding um, that uh, avoiding speculation, avoiding too much um, uh, presumptions is probably important. Liz, do you have any uh, thoughts on that from other specialties and other groups you've talked with? As far as um, uh, capturing cultural differences and humility and... You know, to be honest, um, so a lot of the research around open notes, primary care, pediatrics, mental health, and these different specialties, um, I don't I don't know how much that has come up, and I think it seems like a really uniquely what care question to bring up, um, I, I, which is Awesome, and um, I think it, like something you said earlier, Dr. Sinclair, was this is an opportunity for more research and better understanding about open notes and palliative care, um, and that might be a thing that we further explore. I don't know if Dr. DeRoche is still on the line. Um, it, she might be able to add to that, but I, I, I think she actually had to go. Um, we are capturing all the questions, and if we can add more details to that, we'll be putting this out like a on a blog post on our website, but I'm glad that question was asked. Yeah, and for this and for people who might not want to read, I, all the issues we talked about today, there's an opportunity for anybody to kind of plant their flag and say, I, I think at least this is the basics of what we should do. And for us, to, for that to be the starting point. Now, granted, would that have been a nice for us to have uh, 10 years to do this? Yes, but Open Notes has been around for 10 years too. And unfortunately, our field didn't necessarily jump on this. So that's one thing that I followed Liz and Open Notes for some time. I honestly feel guilty for not banging this drum louder and being like, guys, we need to all do this in our field. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't do it right now. And there's not an opportunity to do it pretty quick um, and still have great conversations and learn from each other in a, a very collaborative way, which I think we do really well in palliative care. Um, there are a couple of questions about chaplains and asking what advice you have. And one particular pediatric chaplain said the notes are written often more for the benefit of the staff to understand family dynamics, et cetera. They worry about jeopardizing the ministerial relationship with the patient and family through documentation about conversations, but also worry about staff losing out on some of the valuable insights. Yeah. And I think especially uh, when you when you lose the burden of billing uh, being a task of the note, I think that's very important. Um, and I think we may see in the over the next couple of years a shift in what does the note mean? What does it mean to other clinicians? Um, and what does it mean to patients and families? So I think this is an opportunity to say, let's have focus groups. Let you know, let's sit some chaplains and some patients and families down and start having conversations. There, there's a lot to explore here. And and unfortunately, I don't have an answer. But excitedly, I don't have an answer. And I think um, there's a lot to explore and understand. And I'm confident that we can do that. We can do and represent well for our different specialties, our different disciplines, and our field of palliative care. Do you have specific guidance for inpatient PC consults where referring team members sometimes change daily? Therefore, the note's the primary mode of communicating across time. Um, if we can't put our complex lasting communication guidance in notes because it may be sensitive, there's no way to keep up with it in person as staff changes shift to shift. Yeah, um, and that's where I think the the team dynamics and the you know, the inter intra team uh, communication we have to figure out are the notes really the best tool for that, and and they may be, and I think we're we're going to try and figure out what that multi 
uh, armed balance is between what the patient may need from the note, what the clinicians may need from the note, um, and what you know billing and legal and other people need from the note. I think there will be some shifts in those balance, um, but um, I, I think the other thing for us to do is make sure to ask ourselves, are the notes are our notes the best tool for that? Because sometimes they may not be. I'm going to pause. We are at time, technically. Um, we could probably talk about this all day. I don't want to, there's, there's still uh, 300 of you left, like still watching at this moment. Um, if you need to go back to work and whatever you're doing, please do so. We are capturing all these questions and we'll be sending out the links to the webinar recorded to our YouTube channel in the coming days, as well as links to all of the slides shared here to including Dr. Sinclair's, you know, here's my note statement, all of that for you to repurpose and learn from, as well as the links to all of the resources on the Open Notes website. Um, as we shut down, Dr. Sinclair, is there anything you want to leave us with? I mean, you're, you're exploring Open Notes in this whole new space. And I, was, I learned so many new things today, and I know we're so surprised and excited about what you've been learning. Any last words you want to share with us? Yeah, I, I think this it's important for us to recognize this is a tool and we need to figure out how to use the tool well. It's actually by itself, it's neutral, um, but it's how we implemented that it can be used and do great things. Um, and I have confidence in our field that we start from a very patient-centered place that we're gonna be able to figure those out. Will it cause some anxiety and stress in the meantime? Yes, but I think together we can really figure this out. Awesome. And and I, I think what's going to be interesting is we know from helping 250 organizations implement open notes before they had to, before the November 2, that most clinicians, there's a lot of anxiety because this is something new that they're going into. There's anxiety in the lead up and maybe in that first month as you're thinking, oh my gosh, we have this new audience who's reading the notes. But three months in, that kind of initial anxiety goes away. And we hear from folks oh, this wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be. And uh, I will say from like with my patient hat on is we have not been reading notes um, our lives. We didn't know clinician notes exist. So you won't get this big uptick of suddenly all these people are reading notes. It will be a gradual onset, especially because most patients will read their notes only after the clinicians have encouraged them to do so. So you may say nothing for a few months until you feel comfortable but once you're ready, start encouraging patients to read their notes because that's when the benefits come in, where they better understand the care plan, where they trust you even more and are more engaged in your care. So um, I encourage, as Liz Salmi, the patient who also works on Open Notes, start telling your patients about this when you're ready. All right. Deb, any final things we need to share? No? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you for Dr. Sinclair as our special guest. Visit opennotes.org to learn more. Signing off.